Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Alex, Catherine, D, 5, 7. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome Alex Catherine, one of the co-hosts of the podcast In Quest of Geek. In Quest of Geek is a pop culture discussion podcast that dives deep into TV, movies, comics, and more. And on that same podcast feed, you can also find the group's actual play campaign of Masks, A New Generation, where Alex plays Spellshock, a magical teen hero from a villainous family. And today, she's here to discuss Young Justice with me. So Alex, I am so excited to welcome you to Whelmed. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you for coming on. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including all three seasons of the show so far, the comics, the video game, and even the audio play. So if you have not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in the intro, but could you tell us a little more about who you are and what you do? Yeah, of course. So um, my name is Alex Catherine, and I run now two podcasts, and then I participate on the third, all under In Quest of Geek. Um, The first one is called Tavern Team, and that one is more of an introduction of the topic. So we're going to talk about the actors, the characters, if there was background information you needed for whatever topic we're doing that week. And just kind of, there's a lot of gatekeeping in in this community, sadly, and being someone who is newer to it, I just, I found roadblock after roadblock. So this was my creation to help other people avoid those roadblocks and gatekeeping and anything else and just be a part of it. And then we have deep uh, dungeon dive, which is our deep dive into the topic. And that one is a little different because we get to talk about how this topic affects social stuff around us. So it could be representation, it could be awareness of, you know, hey, they use this this actor from this place and let's be aware of what's going on and how that affects the world around us and just a really deep conversation about that stuff, which so far, um, our next one coming up, I don't know when this releases, so maybe it's already happened by then, Um, (laughs) but we're doing a silent voice, which is an anime about um, a girl who's deaf. And our guest is going to be somebody whose parents are deaf and she teaches ASL. So we're we're trying to really get those communities out there and those voices heard. And then our last one, which you already mentioned, is Masks, um, which is, you know, where I play a kid whose parents are villains, which is probably how I attached to Artemis and Cheshire without realizing it until I did this watch through. So that was my <laughs> B, but <laughs> I'm excited it works out. Yeah, we will definitely be getting into that very soon. Uh, So when did you first see Young Justice? I know you did a whole big rewatch to come on to Whelmed, uh, but did you first see it when it came out on DVD or on Netflix, or did you watch it when it was first airing on Cartoon Network back in the day? Yeah, so all of those would make me sound really cool, which means none of them are true. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So again, newer to the geek world. And so for me, we actually did a crossover back when in Quest of Geek was Ready, Set, Geek. So I want to say that was 2019. And we had your co-hosts on our show. And to be able to do that, I had to do a binge of Young Justice, which at that point, all three seasons were out on the DC app, which yeah. somebody gave me their password for. And uh, that's how we watched it. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. No, I love hearing people who found the show later because it means that people are still recommending and enjoying this show so many years after it first came out so that's always nice like people are always like oh if you like no gatekeeping here there is no if you didn't see it when it originally (laughs) aired then you're not a real fan because that would make any sense I'm like you found it you liked it welcome please please come here please sit at our lunch table please talk about it with us (laughs) and I didn't have to go through all the pain that you guys went through because I didn't have these the big gaps in between until now, obviously. The, the five-year hiatus. Right. <laughs> oh gosh. That's its own, that's its own adventure of a story. So really, both times I've seen Young Justice was the fault of Whelmed Podcasts. So it's all your guys' <laughs> fault. <laughs> thank you for thank you for getting me here. <laughs> yes, we happily take that responsibility on ourselves. So what was your history with uh, DC and with comics in general before you saw Young Justice? 
Um, so kind of the same concept. I didn't really read the comics. Um, I've never been a big comic reader. I've never been a big reader. Let's just be honest here. My, so my history is really the big DC films, right? Batman, Dark Knight, Justice League, Wonder Woman, all that stuff that we see on the screen. And then I've had a touch of the animated series from our podcast where we try to do new things. Even those, it was like, hey, these are the right episodes to watch of Batman, or these are the right episodes to watch of Justice League, because we just don't have time to do a heavy binge in a week. You don't have time to watch three years of a show in one week for a in single one week. episode I of a know. podcast? <laughs> you can't, you what was I do doing that? with my life? Although I did get through all three seasons in two weeks, so I'm kind of proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> this time around, at least. But a lot of the characters from here are not characters I had seen before seeing Young Justice. So yeah, this was the first introduction to a lot of them. Because the teen heroes don't get enough love in almost any other uh, media platform. I have never seen another show give these heroes as much space and time to do their thing. Which is so sad because they have so many different ways they could do it. But then the other part of me is afraid they'll just get CW'd in the worst way. So it's like mixed feelings. <laughs> I hear you. Part of me is, I am of that thing where I'm like, oh, it'd be so cool to see all these characters in another show. And then I kind of pause and I'm like, there's a high chance another show would just not do the justice this show has done to these characters, Absolutely. no pun intended. Uh, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with my little animated corner of, of the DC universe over here. It really is the best. I mean, okay, again, not a comic reader, but for visual media, I have to say their animated stuff is the best of the DC universe for movies, yeah. for TV shows, everything I've seen so far. It always comes back to the animated as being the best. So highly recommend. Although if they're listening to this, they're probably already there. So never mind. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, that's fine. That's fine. There we've had we've heard tons of people who have like only seen Young Justice and haven't branched out into the other corners of DC and so I often I'm like start with the animated stuff it's good it helps explain stuff in a way that's it will introduce you to a ton of the DC universe in a way that is easy to comprehend where like comics can genuinely be so overwhelming because yes. they often like just assume you have 80 years of knowledge and it's like no I don't know where to start <laughs> Yes, that is exactly how I feel. The where to start is always a big adventure. Yeah, I had, I wrote a 70 page paper on Catwoman. Some people know this about me. And I, my advisor for that paper, when I first sat down with her, literally was like, what do I have to read to understand what we're going to be working on this semester? Oh, and I had no. to give her a list. <laughs> I had to be like, um, here. Poor thing. She's like, okay, so I have to do 80 years of research just to keep up with your one thing of research. No, but it was it was great. It was it was a wonderful thing. Wonderful weird little also wonderful weird little corner of the DC universe to dive into. I'm sure you're a story she tells to like her kids. <laughs> oh, I I am an I was an adventure of an honors thesis. <laughs> So, but branching away from my chaotic uh, comic book adventures, when we decided, uh, when we were deciding what to talk about uh, for this episode today, the thing that you told me had really stood out to you about the show, especially on a rewatch, was uh, the representation of women on Young Justice and especially Artemis and Cheshire, uh, which we mentioned, which to me makes perfect sense for a topic since Inquest of Geek is so devoted to talking about and discussing cultural issues in pop culture and stuff like that. So I'm excited to dive into this topic today. So to start us off, what do you love about Artemis and Cheshire? I love that they're so strong and independent on their own. Neither one of them, they're both stubborn, which isn't great. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're not perfect, but they they both come from damage. And I just, I think what comes out of them is that you don't damage doesn't have to control who or what you are. It, it can help your past, but it doesn't define your future. And I think they kind of prove that in both directions for different reasons, right? One because of dad, one because of mom, because mom really rehabilitated. Right. And so either one of them could have gone down the good route, but dad was a bad guy. So either one of them could have gone down the bad route. And I think it's kind of cool to show that 
choices that they made got them where they are and not choices their parents made or choices that were made for them. And so I think that's just really special because, you know, strong women. (laughs) (laughs) And also even what you were saying about how both of them are stubborn. I I love that about both of them. And I love (laughs) that they're not perfect because it can get very tiring in media when you only have one or two female characters so they have to be perfect because they're the only women on a show yes whereas young justice has enough women that they are all allowed to be flawed people which is very nice so i absolutely agree i love artemis and cheshire as characters they are so interesting especially as the show goes on and we see how both of them develop into people and I think what's really great about them is also the relationship that they share Yes, that we see the two of them have. So what stands out to you about their relationship with each other and even about their place in the larger cast of women in Young Justice? So within themselves, you see it a couple of times um, when they're fighting in the snow, you see Artemis almost get killed and Cheshire saves her and even makes a comment about, look, you're my sister. I don't want you dead. Right. (laughs) Yes. And then when she fakes her death and they go after um, Aqualad, it shows again like, yeah, dad is there for his reputation or whatever, but she was there for Artemis. And then when she figured out that Artemis is alive, she was still there for Artemis. It wasn't like, oh, I'm mad at you and now we're going to have all this drama. It was just like, not cool. I get it. Let's get us out of here. And I love that they have that. They know they're safe with each other. But they still fight for their cause. Yeah. That's so cool. (laughs) I have always loved that this show, with their relationship, instead of doing a sort of like cliched, like, oh, we're on different sides of this and I hate you, even though you're my sister thing, was like, no, these two characters clearly love each other. They're just stuck in this very weird (laughs) uh, conflict of interests kind of thing going on. Where they're like, yeah, we're going to be on opposite sides of the law every day of our lives for 10 years. But you know what? You're still my sister. <laughs> it, it's amazing. And you, they even bring it up with like, oh, you're working with dad. Like that's that's a throw in the face, right? That's the insult is you're working with sports master. And, and it's like, hey, it's a job. Like respect the job. Don't you get it? And I love that they have that even that piece of an understanding. It's it's like she gets she's doing bad things and that's fine. But you're now doing bad things with a sports master. And that's where the line is. Like, <laughs> it's just such a weird dynamic that's so special. Yeah. Even with that particular moment when Artemis calls her out and is like, I can't believe you're working with dad. And her response is like, it's not my choice. And she is clearly so annoyed that she has to do it even in the first place. And how with that, I... I think it is kind of a hilarious thing when you approach it from the outside, but it is such a fun, interesting part of that concept where they're both like, our dad is the worst. It's just sometimes one of us has to work with him. Yeah. Forget that you're working with the light. Forget all these other bad people who have done all these bad things. You've crossed (laughs) the line. You're working with dad. (laughs) It's not. It's not okay. He's the worst. He's the worst. He's a terrible father. (laughs) He is. Like all of the other villains are just are awful people. He's also an awful dad. <laughs> yeah. It's like at least Black Manta is kind of an okay attempt at being a dad. He's trying. Like we don't see what a crappy dad he is until that like the moment that he gets betrayed, which I'd be mad too if I was betrayed by my son that I've, you know, vouched for and staked my reputation on. Yeah. D- Black Manta just wanted to raise his villainous son and have a father-son evil villain business. Yeah. Um, Bonding. It's be great. <laughs> like at least black black manta tried sportsmaster doesn't even try he's just the worst dad <laughs> truly and that goes back to when mom was in jail right so we know at some point they were alone with him we've touched on it before when talking about some of the things that are referenced about artemis's childhood are truly wild. There's the vague, almost not talked about implication that Artemis at the age of 15 has already probably killed someone. And that's wild. Uh, That's insane. (laughs) The fact that she wakes up with no memories and casually tells Kid Flash, oh, my dad probably wants me to kill you, implies that this has happened before. 
Yes. And that she's probably actually done it, which makes me very worried for this child. And I wish we got to see her transition from that side of things to becoming, because Arrow obviously knows she's not his niece. And Batman obviously knows she's not his niece. But how did we get from exactly what you're saying? She's probably killed somebody to, hey, now I'm on the good team and train me. So not to be a professional Young Justice fan for my for a living, but I actually do have an answer <laughs> but to But you this. do, and I love it. Spoil me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like I host a podcast about this or anything, but... In the tie-in comics, uh, our most said phrase on the show, the tie-in comics actually have a two-parter about how Artemis ends up on the team and how Artemis gets recruited. Mm. Uh, And it's about how she kind of, during the last couple of years, like right before, not years maybe, but right before her mom gets out of jail, she's kind of been thinking about like, what if there's a way for me to not do this and has kind of been vigilanteing in Gotham <laughs> on her own and she ends up being the one who shoots the arrow that saves everybody in schooled uh, yes. that we see at the very end the tie-in comics actually show us what she is doing that leads to that moment oh that's awesome she's been out she like stops like a convenience store robbery and sees like a weird robot that she follows and gets into this whole thing and then sees all of these sidekicks doing this thing and saves them and that's what like makes Batman and Green Arrow aware that she exists. And they like come to her and are like, hey, you're 15. Maybe you shouldn't be a rogue vigilante all on your own. Do you want to join our squad of teen superheroes? Who are also rogue vigilantes. But with supervision and adult <laughs> chaperones. <laughs> and that comic actually kind of dives into what leads her there and shows you a little bit of like her relationship with her mom and how she... She's kind of been like it's like she's been living with her dad until her mom comes back and then Mm. her dad leaves again. And it's a whole thing. And it's it's good. Highly recommend the tie in comics to anyone listening. Um, Yeah, I think I'm going to have to now that I've done my second watch. Yeah, I think I need more. Yes, they're very good. They're I think they're all available on the new DC Universe Infinite or whatever the comics platform they have is now. Or they're coming out in new print uh, paperbacks very soon. That That's what I'll do. <laughs> yes, they have been very, everyone has been very excited that they're getting a nice, a nice reprint many years after they were initially released. And everyone's like, ooh, these look fancy. I assume it's to tie in with a release of season four. Hopefully, yes. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a release date on that yet, but we do. We do know that all of the tie-in comics are going to be back in print in nice little collected editions that'll look very nice on anyone's shelf who wants them. So yeah, if you want to know what's up with Artemis, (laughs) highly recommend the tie-in comics. They're very good. They do a fun thing all about that exact question of, wait, how did Artemis get here? So to go go back to Artemis and Cheshire, I wanted to hear your thoughts on one of the things that I think is so interesting about how the show has gone on uh, over the course of three seasons is how they approach Cheshire being a mom and having Leon and that entire relationship that feels very unique and very interesting to me. So I don't know. Do you have thoughts on that? So that to me is the most disappointing storyline that I had in the entire show. Interesting. Because I love Cheshire and I thought her season two interactions with the Leon, you know, bringing her to actual <laughs> crimes or chaos assassin and, mom. Yeah. Yes. It's so chaos assassin mom is the best. I'm sorry, but that is the most Cheshire thing on the planet <laughs> with Leon laughing. And, and it's just, it shows that she still cares about her. Right. She's not just dumping her off somewhere. She clearly has an attachment. She clearly has a bond. And what's special with her and Leon is what helps bring, you know, her family back together to bring closure, all of that. And so I thought it was so special and and I was intrigued and I was ready for more. And again, I'm sure tie in comics, but from season two to season three, that was my biggest disappointment. Because I didn't see Cheshire as abandoning her daughter. I imagined, yeah, maybe she's not there all the time. 
but I pictured fights of like, you have to stop taking her to these, to these things or secret training, secretly training her, even though she can barely walk, she can like do certain moves. Right. Or even just her sneaking into the house and being caught reading Alice in Wonderland, which was her poster, which is where Cheshire came from. That connection of this was my childhood. And even though I'm not fully in your life, I, I, I needed something. I needed something from there. I didn't picture her as a runner. I mean, I guess she is because she left her sister with her dad. But <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so maybe there is historical precedence for this action. <laughs> but <laughs> here it is. I say it out loud. But it was still my biggest disappointment. That it, I felt let, let down, you know. So that's really interesting to me, actually, because like I know me and many a person was upset because we do we love Cheshire and I want to see Cheshire be a chaos mom and how Greg Weissman, creator of Young Justice, had talked about uh, when season two first aired. I remember back in the day, there was the Ask Greg website where he would answer questions from people. And Mm -hmm. a lot of people had asked at one point, what are what are Cheshire and Red Arrow? Are they okay? Kind of thing because they were after they kind of like got back together, sort of in season two. They were kind of just background characters we never really saw yeah. for a while. Uh, and his answer at that point, at the during the like latter half of season two, was that they were back to being together and attempting to raise Leon as a family. And so I feel like a lot of people were kind of hoping we we're like season three. Are we going to see the the Chaos Assassin family, please? But at the same time, I feel like it is kind of very in character for Cheshire to kind of have that moment where faced with this thing and being like, oh, Will is a wonderful and amazing dad. And I have so many issues with the entire concept of family and I need to just run away forever. Uh, (laughs) So it's the thing where it's like it makes sense. But at the same time, you're like, but I want but I want this. I want you to be happy. I want you to go to therapy and be happy. And I want to see the issues. Like, I think that would have been such a great story too of, you know, them having to help each other on different missions where maybe he has to do something bad to help her out for a night or she has to do something good and to help him out for a night, but neither one of them are happy about it. And, you know, there's so many different ways it just could have gone and none of it went the way I needed it to go. (laughs) I hear that. And it's weird. It's funny because all of that that you just listed as stuff that could happen is stuff that happens in the video game. If you read Red Arrow's stuff in the Red Arrow has a series of journals that you can collect as collectibles in the video Mm. game. Uh, And they actually tell a really interesting story over five years of like his search for trying to find the original Roy Harper and like how he ends up running into Cheshire and they start like accidentally dating and he joins the League of Assassins for a while and she betrays a bunch of villains to save him and that's how he realizes wait we're in an actual relationship and it's a very cool little subplot that happens in that game that has a lot going on so <laughs> this is this is the episode of Emily goes okay but Artemis and Cheshire have so many storylines off screen right and clearly I'm right near all of them I just didn't <laughs> dive deep enough to find any of them no it means that the show does a good enough job of setting up that like emotionally i feel like this thing happened even though you never showed it to me yeah absolutely (laughs) emotion in my heart i know this is somewhere and the creator's like yes it's just in a different format (laughs) that was all considered canon the game and the comics okay yes all of that is the game comics and the DC fandom audio play are all considered canon to the Young Justice universe. <laughs> Wonderful chaos across many formats, but I highly do recommend all of them. So the gameplay in the video game is a little iffy, but the storyline is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But and a side note about uh, the Cheshire being a mom thing, the thing that I find interesting about that, and I feel like you might have some take on this, is that a lot of superhero media, and I actually I came across this when I was reading when I was reading and doing research for my Catwoman paper that I wrote a million years ago. It seems like now that in comics there tends to be a not great tendency that when female superheroes or supervillains have kids, they either stop being a superhero or they give up their child in some way or another. And that's not great when you look at all of the male superheroes who have kids and still go out and be superheroes. Mm -hmm. 
when it's like, oh, yeah, no, Catwoman can't be Catwoman and have a daughter, but Batman can raise three sons and still fight crime every other night. Although maybe questionable parent raising there. <laughs> maybe, but it's, you know? it's superheroes. <laughs> In Young Justice, Batman is a good dad, and that's the canon I subscribe to. Fair enough. Batman Inc. is, is a good family. <laughs> but the thing that I think is very interesting about Young Justice is that if... Cheshire was the only like superhero mom that we got in the whole show and this was how she was portrayed I might have more issues with it but the fact that she is one of several especially that we see in season three of like nah a bunch of different superpowered people have kids and are dealing with it in varying ways of of good to bad (laughs) and that's the thing that we were talking about of Young Justice has enough female characters in it that they are allowed yes. to be flawed and do things that are kind of questionable because there are so many other examples of going, but we're not saying this is the only way that this can, kind of concept can be treated. Right. And even within that own family dynamic, yes, Cheshire ran away, but Artemis ended up going back to Tigris while still raising Leon. And I think normally what we would have seen is okay, well, now Artemis is going to stay home with the kid and Red Arrow is going to come back because he's the man and, you know, he has to go to work. And and I'm kind of excited that in that dynamic, although I'm very disappointed with what happened to Cheshire, Artemis, on the other hand, with Tigris, still got to prove I can do this within this household. And then you're right. We saw baby playdate of supers. <laughs> so many adorable superpowered kids. But yeah, and even with that, I know Rich and I talked a lot about it when it first came out, but the idea that Young Justice presented uh, Artemis, Will, and Leon as a family, even though they aren't a traditional family structure, was awesome to see on the show and be like, yes, sometimes a family is a dude, his kid, and his sister-in-law, and sometimes that is a family, and that's fine. And that, yeah. <laughs> Red Arrow is a good is a good work in a normal job dad and Artemis is a superhero who's like, yeah, no, I, that's just my job. That's what I'm going to go do. Right. Even taking in strays like they took in Tara, they took in Halo, they took in Forager, they took in um, Breon. You know, I've seen families like that where it's like, oh, th- my kid's friend, their parents are, aren't there all the time and the kid pretty much lives with me. I mean, how many times have we heard that story? And so it's kind of cool that even, again, Tigris or Artemis never had to step down, but they had not just one kid, but multiple kids in a weird, kind of similar to Batman Inc., but (laughs) a weird family dynamic where it was just like, another one needs a roof, let's bring them in. (laughs) They need food, let's feed them. And and I loved getting to see that. And I know... One of the other things that I have always found very interesting about Artemis and Cheshire is also the way that like Artemis and Cheshire and then their mom, Paula, and even with Leon, who I hope continues to get more screen time and continues to be more of a character. Give me tiny middle school Leon who is (laughs) doing weapons training, please. Give this wonderful kind of generational story of the women in a single family. And it's Wonderful and interesting to see all of those different dynamics in a way that is so complex and nuanced, especially in a show that is ostensibly about teenage superheroes saving the world. They're like, also, we're going to have complex conversations about (laughs) about what different people in your family expect you to do. I mean, even with school, I mean, we could look at the moment that Artemis got the Bruce Wayne Foundation scholarship which yeah. you know, is Batman, but not Batman. <laughs> and what a big deal that was to her mom who look at where we came from. Look at what a big deal. I'm guessing she's the first one to graduate high school. I'm guessing she's the first one to go to college. And to her mom, that was such a big deal to get your degree, get a real job, take care of Leon, don't end up like me. But if you step back from the superhero part of that, what a big deal it was for her to say, look, you got the scholarship and that's something I can't provide you and beyond, yes, you want to be with your friends, but look at this opportunity. And, and I think that's so huge to come from point A and yes, she got it from being Artemis without realizing it, but the opportunity for that family, because it changes the life Leon will have school will be important for Leon now because it was important to Artemis. Yeah. 
Definitely. And at the same time, the whole conversation that happens in season three in the Thanksgiving episode, whose name is slipping my mind because season three has a lot of interestingly named episodes that do not stick in my brain. (laughs) How that they have that entire conversation where her mom is still very fixated on that concept. And Artemis is like, but it's my life that I get to decide what I do with it. And I am helping people and through this, through being a superhero, through training these kids, through doing what adults did for me when I was this age and how that is super important to Artemis. And her mom is just not clicking with that idea. And having all of these characters in this family who like, Paula is not the bad guy in that situation. They're just coming at it from completely different angles. Right. And it's and it's great to see on a show like this to see that the show doesn't say that Paula is wrong and it doesn't say that Artemis is right. It just says that both of them are completely at odds in that conversation and that they both of them have a point. <laughs> yeah, and we even get to see a little bit of her mom's point when we're in the dream state, I'll call it. Yeah. The um, hallucination. The, we gave you a mental playground to say goodbye to your dead boyfriend. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Megan's <whatever>, world. <laughs> whatever we call that situation. Which really, I feel like as a therapist, she could be doing so much good for people by doing that. <laughs> but also so much harm. But I don't yeah. know. It's, it's kind of a cool therapy trick that I wish somebody could do for me. <laughs> it's the thing where it's like, this seems like a good idea until it's put in practice. And then they're like, oh, this this would have problems. Which I think is why Miss Martian, who went through her entire season two arc, goes, we're not going to do this on we're a regular basis. No. But Artemis is having a struggle. Yeah. <laughs> We saw it in the training that they did where she accidentally got too emotional in it and yeah. the damage that could happen. So I agree. It definitely shouldn't be done. But in that in that scene, we get to see like what would have happened if she, well, if he had lived, obviously. And then if they had stayed out of the game and what they would have been doing and how they would have been helping. And you can see her just as proud of that life as she is of the life she's living. And I think that highlights again, that neither is right, neither is wrong. It's just a different, again, choices is what we see a lot of, you know, the choices that they make and how they affected the steps they took. Yeah. It's great to see a show like this saying that the idea of having a family and getting married and having kids is just, can be just as fulfilling as anything else that as long as that is what you're choosing to do and what you are happy to do with your life. So yeah, in a show where people punch monsters and save the world, it is nice to see it celebrating all choices of a lifestyle uh, that whatever makes you happy as long as you aren't hurting anyone can be a good life path. Agreed. (laughs) So we touched on this a little bit before, but I do want to ask, even though this might be an odd question, was Artemis one of the inspirations for your masks character, you know, given that they're both younger siblings of villainous families? (laughs) with complex relationships <laughs> I want to say no because it honestly didn't even cross my mind but I had definitely seen Young Justice I saw again 2019 and fell in love Artemis was one of my favorites the first time I watched it and so part of me wonders as I was re-watching it I was like oh 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 I did that that was that <laughs> oh and so I'm like, did I, my subconscious do that and make that connection? But my inspiration was actually my family. Obviously, my parents love us both equally. But there's a big long running joke that my brother is a child because he's favorite child. And my brother is actually really smart. And so a lot of the inspiration came from just the family dynamic I already have. And then how I could make that an interesting twist. <laughs> But when I went back and watched this, I was like, oh, no, I just really just made that and changed the mom. And that's because <laughs> my mom is like the top of the villain chain. And obviously she's already done all of that and is now at the on the other side of things. And I'm still in the thick of it. So it is very similar in characters. <laughs> and 
I, I don't know where that's going to lead me, but I have to say, if I could connect to a character, that would be the one. So I'm kind of happy that that's what I ended up being close to. <laughs> I feel like I feel like this happens a lot with ma- with role playing games in general, but especially with masks, since it is so based off a specific genre of people make characters and then kind of later go, oh, I kind of mashed together seven characters into one. <laughs> into- <laughs> This teenage superhero is just seven other superheroes in a trench coat. Absolutely. <laughs> Might be the best description for it I've ever heard. But yes, that's how it, watching it, that's how I felt. It was like a light bulb clicked and the glass shattered. And I was like, oh, wait. I have seen, I feel like I've seen many people playing many different role playing games talk about that. They're like, oh, I made this character and I've been playing them for two years. And then I went back and rewatched a movie I hadn't watched in like eight years. And I realized, oh, I guess that's where a bunch of that came from. <laughs> I mean, it's bound to happen. If you think, you know, we mentioned 80 years. It's like, am I really going to be more creative than these people who've existed for that long? Probably not. Let's be honest. So, <laughs> at least I can emulate the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I've joked that like my my main uh, masks character on Protean City Highwire is like I mashed up like Nightwing and Harley Quinn and like four other characters into one circus themed reformed villain <laughs> ball of chaos. And I was like, yeah, no, that's just how masks works. Just just take bits and pieces of everything you love and make and make a thing and set it loose on a fictional city. Exactly. <laughs> Ta-da, I made this. <laughs> there it is. So outside, getting back to Young Justice for me. Yes, because <laughs> I can go off this this deep end all day too. <laughs> it's it's all connected. It's all connected. But outside of Treasure and Artemis, this show has really just so many amazing female characters, from the team to the league to the villains to reoccurring non-powered characters who show up all the time. There's such a big cast on this show. The women of Young Justice are just complex and interesting, and I love them. If this isn't apparent to listeners yet. (laughs) So what are your thoughts on some of the other women on the show? Which ones stand out to you as having really great arcs or character moments or just real cool stuff that you like about them? (laughs) I mean, okay, let me start by saying, because you know this off air, obviously, but trying to pick a topic was the hardest thing on the planet because this (laughs) show is just so good. I want to acknowledge and reiterate that there's so many incredible pieces and story arcs and characters and dynamics. And and I narrowed it down to these two because I think they highlight so many great things. But with these characters, with these female characters, I think the best version of them is at the tree. We see it twice. We see it once with Zatanna and then we see it with Artemis with this, the story we were just talking about with Valentine's Day. Where we're not here for this part. Yeah. We're here for the part that comes after. I can't tell you how many times I've been there for the part that comes after or somebody's been there for the part that comes after for me. You go to a stranger's funeral, right? It's nobody you know, but it's your friend's grandparent or some kind of somebody important to them, right? You don't go for you. Obviously, it's weird to go to a stranger's funeral, but you're there because you know at some point that person needs you. And when we see that in television, 90% of the time, it's the guys. And I thought yeah. it was so special that both times it was highlighted, it was women supporting women because that's how I see it in real life. And that's how we need to be seeing it on TV so that younger generations will put that into the world. Yeah. And so just those two moments, I think, are so powerful. Absolutely agree. I know I I wrote this in our notes for this, that I think one of the things that I really love about the way women are portrayed on Young Justice is that the show gives so many unique and different dynamics between these women that like Artemis's friendship with Satana in those moments and in other moments is distinct and unique from the friendship that she has with Miss Martian and how Miss Martian's uh, dynamic with like her cheerleader friends is entirely different from either of those relationships and how they're not just all having like the exact same kind of friendship that I feel like some shows fall into of like all women treat all other women exactly the same way. And it's like, no, we're unique and different (laughs) people. (laughs) 
who have unique and different dynamics with our friends. Yeah, absolutely. And just the fa- like that moment in season three when we see the fact that Artemis has been going with Zatanna to do this thing every year for like five, six, however many years. It's never especially established. It's never directly referenced. But the idea that these two people have been friends this long and that this is something incredibly important to them that they still do, that Artemis still does for her, is so great to see in a show like this, that there are these complex friendships that aren't just the very fun, like, girls' night out Halloween episode from season one. That is great. But also yeah, I was touching, say also great. <laughs> also great. Um, but showing that, like, there is that and then there's the like emotional support that comes with that friendship and the show gives room for both of those things and does that with a lot of these relationships that I think is so good and so wonderful. Totally. I even want to point out too, when we're talking about these women from season one to two to three, obviously there's big gaps, right? It's like a five-year gap and then a two-year gap, but how many times do you have big gaps and the person is still exact, the female character is still exactly the same. I don't keep my hairstyle that long. (laughs) Most women I know don't, right? You change your hair, you change your clothing style, you change how you see yourself, who you are. Artemis changes into into just Artemis, not superhero Artemis, into Tigress where she felt she could be somebody different. It's mostly highlighted with Megan or Megan where it's like how she sees herself when she first comes to earth. And then as she's grown and everything she goes to and you clearly she gets to change all of her but you get to see that breakup hair and you get to see that breakup body right because she can just change that too (laughs) just the idea of referring to the pixie cut as breakup hair like we all know what it means (laughs) i want breakup hair from 2020 like i think you can have breakup hair from so many different things but we all know if you say breakup hair it's a very specific difference that you're going for and And we see these characters get to go through those moments, but not alone. She still had her same friends, right? And I think so many times it's like, if the character changes, then they can no longer be friends with those people because, no, they're too different now. So they've had now separated. And this show didn't do that. The characters were allowed to change and grow. Their friendships were allowed to change and grow. And you just got to follow that growth instead of, oh, now they're fighting because... The the girls have grown in different paths. It's it's not that. And I love that it's not that. Absolutely agree. I know even along those lines, I remember in season two, when we get the first episode that Artemis comes back and rejoins the team for one episode, one of the first things we see happen is like McGann runs up and hugs her because they're still friends and they just haven't seen each other in a while because they're on opposite sides of the country and they're not fighting crime together as much anymore. And it was just so great then and still great rewatching the show to be like, it's nice to see that these characters all still like each other. Yes. That they're all still friends and that they all still hang out and everything. And even what you were saying about like seeing the way people grow and like even their styles changing and stuff like that. It's the thing of like season two, I find it hilarious and wonderful that when Artemis comes back to the team for one episode in her original Artemis gear, she doesn't have a crop top anymore because she's just like, that was 15-year-old Artemis who apparently thought fighting crime in a crop top was a good idea and we're not going to do that anymore. (laughs) She's like, I'm 22 and I'm going to wear a real shirt. (laughs) I'm going to wear a full shirt with probably some armor. Yes. Because, like, I get I get that fighting crime in a crop top is probably, like, a power move that will make you feel very confident and, like, you can take on the entire world. But also, please protect Protect your internal organs. (laughs) I feel that so much. It's like, well, you look athletic, which is great, right? It's like going out in a sports bra and you're tough and you're strong. But, like, when they cut you, (laughs) you're in trouble. I I don't know what to do. (laughs) Oh, but. Yeah, no, the it's it's just one of those things where I'm like, I get it, but also please, please be safe. <laughs> please, please don't get please don't get stabbed. Right. Which, you know, when you bring that up, it's kind of cool to point out that the girls, it wasn't all crop tops. It wasn't all tiny costumes, or it wasn't they weren't all the same, right? Everybody's own style, everybody, some people were a little less dressed, some people were more dressed. 
And, and I love that too. Cause I mean, again, oh, everybody has to be in tight leather and heels. Cause it's a woman and their tatas have to be pushed up. We don't care how old they are. They have to have taught, you know, and, and I never felt they were athletic, but they were never sexualized. And I, I, I'm happy that we don't see because they're kids, let them be kids. And I love that they got to be that. Yes. Cause it's one of those things where like, I absolutely, I like Miss Martian's costume in the first season. And I know some people had problems with it and I get that she is <laughs> wearing heels and a skirt to fight crime sometimes, but also the show goes out of its way to be like, she doesn't wear this all the time when she's doing stuff, when they are doing stealth missions or they are going somewhere where this is super impractical. She wears something else. And it's not just like, oh, she by season two, she's older and wiser and wears pants now. It's like, no, she wears pants in season one. It's just, you know, sometimes you want to wear a skirt and heels and do that. I'm not I can't like I'm trying to remember a time when she wore that while like actually going on a mission. And there are very few she just has that for the style of it. And I support it. Well, let's be clear for a second, though. If you have the power to create your own clothing, you're making the world's most comfiest heels that anybody has ever had. It's not like reality where you buy a pair of heels and you're like, well, fashion knows no pain. I'm going to suffer and walk like a T-Rex. No, she gets to make them as comfortable as she wants them to be. So, yeah, she can rock heels and still be awesome. Because they're comfortable and non-realistic because she's a Martian. <laughs> I have made this argument so many times and I'm glad that other people have too. <laughs> My argument has always been people are like, well, why would you wear a skirt if you're a character who flies? And I'm like, I hear what you're saying, but also it's a skirt that she controls with her mind. So <laughs> no issues. And if you're a Martian and that's not your real body, because right, she's really the white Martian then she didn't grow up worrying about those little pieces. So it's probably not even something in her mind. It's just skirt is cute, ties into, you know, hello, Megan. And she, you're right. She could control the piece, the flow of the skirt too. I look adorable fighting in a dress if I could control every aspect of it. Let me tell you. <laughs> it's a big, it's a big mood. <laughs> I'm like, I want to have a sword and I want to wear a dress and I want to do both of these things all of the time. <laughs> and I want it to move with my body, but not flash anybody. Can you make that happen? <laughs> Even some of like the other redesigns for costumes on this show, it's like we see Arrowette in season uh, three and <laughs> an uh, just a one of the million blonde archers of DC Comics. And if you read the original Young Justice comics, her costume is a choice uh and i very much appreciate that the show is like we're gonna give her pants and tactical armor instead of a crop top and a mini skirt uh because i'm like at least artemis wore pants combat boots and knee pads with her crop top if we were gonna go crop top and mini skirt i was gonna maybe have some problems yeah that's where i have to draw a line <laughs> You can't control that skirt with your mind. You need better battle attire. <laughs> Especially for someone who's raised for battle. Might not be good battle, but she was raised for battle. So she better be dressed to fight. Costume, the costuming of Young Justice is an entire other topic that we're going to dive into someday. We're going to find somebody yes. who wants to talk about it. Because the costume designs on the show are great. Okay, I will keep that in mind. But speaking of all of the... Uh, <laughs> original girls of the first season. Uh, one thing that I wanted to bring up in this, in talking about fighting crime in heels and such, I really loved the portrayal of Black Canary on the show and especially her relationship with the team and like the leadership role that she has on the team. Because I struggle to think of many other shows like this, especially in the era that this was coming out. We have in animation gotten better in the nearly 10 years uh, that from when Young Justice first premiered. But having the combat instructor for a team of teenage superheroes be a woman uh, and have her be a woman who is confident and in control of her life and who is also clearly like a licensed registered uh superhero therapist and having assume. both of these things be true about black canary and having her be both just completely 
strong and independent and amazing and capable in battle and also incredibly empathetic and incredibly caring uh, and willing to help is just such a good combination. And I love it. It, It's what I think is really great about it. And I think it's highlighted with her relationship with Superboy where it's like, well, I have super strength. So why should I bother? And we see that all the time, right? Or, oh, I I have a big man around me. I'm fine. Right. And, and Robin highlights, no, like she has to fight people with super strength. She has to fight people with superpowers. And then we see it over and over again where she takes them down. And I think it proves that it's not size. It's not even talent. It's the willing to learn. It's the practice, right? We're going to do move seven, which seems to be the move they always do, by the way. Um, Number seven. We don't know (laughs) what one through six are, and we don't know what eight and above are, but we know what maneuver seven is. always maneuver seven. (laughs) It's a combat-oriented cheerleader throw, and I'm here for it. It is, and I love it. But I, I love the idea that when you're newer, right? How many times if you've ever taken a class where it's like, okay, I'm going to do this one combination that I know really well and then tie it into these things because I know this combination. And they do that and it, it, it makes sense. It's not just, look, I trained them and now they're really talented. It shows that she's training them in the right way which I, I used to, oh, so random. I used to coach roller skating <laughs> um, and I did that for like, 20 years of my life. So when I, when I look at that and it's like, you can't just coach somebody and then they're magically doing triples, right? You have to coach somebody and there are certain jump combinations or spin combinations that, that make sense if you teach it to them in the right way, but they also then get hooked on those, those things. And so when I watch them and it's like, okay, we're doing this maneuver. And then later you just see them naturally do it. And then when it's the next generation, hey, do this maneuver. And then again, next season, you, and you can tell there's a progression to their learning. And, and from a coach standpoint, getting to see that tells me that they, they wrote the story in the right way. Yeah. They didn't forget that detail as it went on. Yeah, I, that's, that is great. I love that. And with your what you were saying with her relationship with Superboy, one of the kind of little tiny subplots of the show among 10 million subplots that happen on this series <laughs> that I love. I know uh, Greg Weissman has talked about this. Uh, over the course of the series, Superboy essentially takes over Black Canary's job for like future generations of the team. And they and he's talked about that. And I think it is such a cool, interesting and lovely bit of the way that that team has grown and evolved of how like as it went on they started having the teenagers started becoming adults so they became the adult mentors for that team yeah so, like, black canary went back to just being like okay i'm gonna mainly do league stuff now and that's fine but that like her and superboy had such a like great mentor and mentee relationship that she trained him enough to be like, okay, you can do this now. You can train younger generations in the way that I helped you figure out how to not just punch your way through a wall. And what a respect level for him to keep those things, right? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it my way and I'm going to be better than her. By seeing, again, Maneuver 7, it shows that there was a respect in what he learned and what he's teaching. And I kind of think it's cool that him and Megan or McGann like split Black Canary because he does all the fighting stuff, but she really learns and takes over all the therapy stuff. And it's kind of cool that the two who ended up together are are really just a mesh of this mentor that they had and what an influence that was. Yeah, I totally agree. I love that even like that the first episode that we see Black Canary really doing stuff in school, uh, that that episode ends with, an explicit acknowledgement of Superboy going to her and being humble and being like, you're right, I do need help. And having that moment of respect that I feel like happens a lot with male characters with a male mentor who's like the wise old owl of a group. But like you, I feel like I like I keep like I don't want to give Young Justice too much credit because I'm sure there are other places that do this that I just haven't seen. Uh, But like I can't think of another time especially when this was first coming out that I'd really seen that that I'd seen like young super strong teenage boy be like 
this older adult woman is right and I should learn from her. Rare, rarely happens, I feel like, in this in genre. It media. does. It's something, it's funny because you watched it in the beginning, right? And, and we're talking about a show that, that's been out for how long? And, you know, we just did a rewatch of Josie and the Pussycats for the 20th anniversary. And we, we discussed like, okay, we're watching it from the lens of 2021. This show is new to me. So I had to watch it from the lens of 2019 and the lens of 2021. And to see those, it it didn't click to me that this show is 10 years old because the stuff that I was seeing is like, Yes, this is the change I'm looking for. Oh, wait, this already happened. How long ago? How is nothing else doing what they're doing? Like, I want it. I'm the opposite. I want to just credit awards. I want to bow down. I want to set off an arrow that this show does right with the lens of 2021 on it. And that's so impressive for where it came from. I agree. It's wonderful. I know we've... (laughs) I talk about how much I love the show a lot. There are a lot of episodes of this podcast, but like, yeah, it's amazing. And I have like, I like, even now there are certain aspects of this show that I'm like, why haven't I seen more of this, whatever it is in other stuff. And that's definitely one of them of having adult female characters that younger male heroes look up to and are like, you're good at your job and I respect you. And having that not be, part of some like I feel like when other shows had done this especially when this was first coming out it was often in an episode that was about like a dude learning a lesson about Mm -hmm. like vague for children feminism that is those episodes are not inherently bad but sometimes they get a little tiring of like okay we get it you've learned a lesson that women are capable great job but why did you it's just the one time yeah (laughs) whereas I like that this show doesn't make that moment about like, like when Superboy comes in and is like, oh, I don't want to listen to Black Canary. I know what I'm doing. It's not about like, oh, I don't want to listen to a girl or whatever. It's like, it's just Superboy being like, I literally have a super strength. Why do I need to listen to anybody? And it's also only because he has just gone through a really upsetting, traumatic thing with Superman is like most right. of the reason Superboy walks in in an awful mood in that scene. says daddy issues. <laughs> Superboy has so many issues and he grows so much and I love him. But having that moment that is such an impactful and great moment at the end of that episode without having it be like some sort of preachy thing about how women are capable and wonderful. It's just we're going to show you a character doing a thing that should be way more common and we're just going to have it be a part of this episode. And really, you know, now that we're talking about it and I'm trying to think back, There was never a damsel in distress episode. No, not really. The the one that comes close is only done to subvert it. And I kind of in season three, there's the Queen Perdita in one episode gets kidnapped. Yes. uh, When she's out with Garfield and she gets like knocked out and kidnapped. And what I love about their subversion of that is like, okay, yes, you are a non-powered human who has been knocked out by psychic means and been kidnapped, which is fine. Uh, It happens. And you have five teenage superheroes coming to save you. And the second she wakes up, she just kicks him and incapacitates him because she's like, I I have I am a queen. I have some level of self defense training. Yes, I was just unconscious. It was it was a kidnapping, but it wasn't a damsel in distress. Yes. She is not waiting around for someone to save her. She right. is just waiting for a moment to be like in a good position to try to save herself, and then wait for people who are stronger to come <laughs> incapacitate him for longer. And with a character like Artemis, with I wouldn't say Meganic could have happened, but I think with Artemis and with Zatanna and some of the other female characters, it would have been so easy for them to do. And I'm so impressed that it was, they never took that easy road because I think it would have characters a bit. Yeah, I definitely see that. And the show doesn't act like any of these characters are invincible, which is sometimes the inverse that shows do with like <laughs> our girl is so strong that she she can't be a damsel in distress because nothing bad can ever happen to her which sometimes is good and validating and we need in media but sometimes it gets a little tiring whereas this show goes out of its way to be like 
everyone has vulnerabilities and everyone is strong or weak in certain fights. So there are episodes where like there's a season one episode that I am blanking on the name of, but it's the one where everybody with powers gets incapacitated and it's just Robin and Artemis trying to save all of them. Yeah. And how like that for that with moment. The robots. Yes. For like that episode, like Kid Flash is more of a damsel in distress in that one episode <laughs> than anybody else kind of thing. But it isn't played like that and it isn't played as like a subversion or an inversion of that trope. It's just played as sometimes, sometimes people need help <laughs> and that's fine. Or like even... I feel like this whole podcast is really just your way of getting everybody into your favorite thing and then get to talk about your favorite thing so much that we all re-fall in love with it all over again <laughs> because it's totally working. Like... <laughs> I drank the Kool-Aid when I watched it, but I'm like re-drinking the Kool-Aid as I talk to you. <laughs> oh no, you've uncovered our secret. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> but yeah, like it is touched on as a concept in the show, but it is never played straight. Like there is, again, I am blanking on episode titles today, but there is like a whole episode in season one where the team is all right after that same episode, the team is just so mad at each other and everybody's going off in different directions and nobody wants to work together and they're all mad about everything. And in that episode, Superboy, after almost seeing his girlfriend die, keeps trying to be big, strong protector man, literally only because he's like, you almost died right in front of me and I was very worried and I don't know how to deal with these emotions because I'm less than a year old. <laughs> And I appreciate that the show plays it as that. Like, it isn't just, I'm big, strong protector, man. Let me protect you. It's like, I had an emotionally traumatic experience and I don't know what to do with these feelings, but also <laughs> still has McGann call him out and be like, no, stop, try stop trying to be overprotective. Don't do that. And he's like, okay, okay, that's fair. Yeah, and he listens, which I love. Yeah. She explains why that doesn't work. And then he listens, which is just... Such a great concept. Wow. <laughs> Male characters listening to their female love interests in genre media, we love. Just astounding. <laughs> we support wholeheartedly. And it shouldn't be that astounding is mainly what I'm saying. Like, there are things on this show and things in, like, many of my favorite genre media things where I'm like, I should not be shocked that this is happening because it should be way more common. But I'm so happy and shocked. Yep. A hundred percent all the time. <laughs> yep. As a kind of final wrap up question for today, as yeah. we're getting close to the end of this episode, when it comes to the women of Young Justice, what do you hope we see in season four? What would make you super happy in season four when it comes to the female characters? I mean, I feel like the obvious answer here is going to be Cheshire. I want her back. Don't um, we all? <laughs> give her back to me. Bring this um, chaos assassin mom back. Let her be a chaos assassin mom. Yes, preach it, all of it. <laughs> uh, beyond that, I think uh, we didn't get to touch on Halo, and that's another episode, another day, but she is non-binary at one point, which I think is really special, yeah. and we get to see her kind of figure out her sexuality, which may be straight, bisexual, gay, doesn't matter, right? She gets to be who she wants to be, and that's cool. Could be fluid. And we see the same thing a little bit with Aqualad, but that's two characters. And where we leave off is this big 300 teens getting dropped off, right? And so what I would like to see is more, more of just them getting to be themselves, whatever they decide themselves is. Because here they are, they're going to get dropped off. And you know, it's got to focus on where these teens are now. I mean, how can it not? And, and so what I want, you know, I want more of those special things that shouldn't be special, but we, we are now producing this in, with a 2021 lens and how many people are saying, I want to be seen. I want to be heard. And we've seen this show do it each and every time before the trend was even there before it should have been something we had to fight for. They were already doing it. And so what I hope and what I expect from this show is, is more of that, more people of color, more people who are, whatever gender, more people who are whatever sexuality, more, just more diversity because they have the opportunity to do so and the platform to do it. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. I want 
more of all of those things. I love Halo and have loved seeing her journey and I hope it gets explored more because I think it a lot of the time Halo gets lumped into like lists of like the best female characters on Young Justice, but it's super important to remember and acknowledge that like, no, Halo is a non-binary person who just uses she, her pronouns and we will see where that goes and how she like figures out who she is and what she's doing. But it's important not to just lump her into that category because I know some people have because they just forget out in the world. It, it's fine. But I hope that gets explored more and I hope we continue to have more characters across many identities and everything. Like the show introduced uh, Harper Rowe, which who is a com- character in the comics who a lot of people are hoping we get to see her do more Yes. More in the future and get to see her be, I think her superhero name in the comics is Bluebird. So I would totally be up for seeing her be a hero. Ah, oh, the blue hair. Yes. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> <laughs> but like her and everything just more across the board. Yes. And also Cheshire being a chaos assassin mom. Has to be. <laughs> yes. Because it's just, it is so important. And I feel like this show has done a good job and there is always room for improvement on anything there is always more room for more diversity and more representation that is super important but like when halo had that first conversation talking about how she didn't feel like she was a girl and was trying to figure out what that meant uh and how gender is even more complex when you are an entity that is a piece of living technology now inhabiting the body of a human on another planet uh and what does gender mean then (laughs) was really impactful and really meaningful. And I feel like I might be wrong, but I remember a lot of articles talking about it when it first came out of like, Halo might be the first non-binary superhero in like a piece of DC television or at least DC animated television Mm. and how that was really important to a lot of people. And I hope that the show continues to have more characters like that and explore more of that with Halo or with other characters and explore the wonderfulness that was Aqualad and his relationship with wind uh, and all of that. So thank you so much for spending some time with us here in the Watchtower, Alex. Uh, Where can people find you here on Earth Prime? Yeah, they can find me um, at Inquest of Geek, which is going to be Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. um, And all of those also have a link to our Discord. So people could actually hang out with us there. We also have a Twitch stream which is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. Right now I run Women Wednesdays, um, (laughs) which is all females playing video games on Wednesdays. So that's a fun one that everybody should check out. And yeah, we have all three podcasts, Tavern Team, Dungeon Dive, and Masks, which will say issues, um, all on one RSS feed. So they can find us pretty easily for podcasting. Wonderful. Yes, definitely go check them out. I was... People may have noticed I was on an episode of Inquest of Geek one time, and it was very fun, and we talked more about teenage superheroes. So if you don't know where to start, start there, and then go and listen to a bunch of their other stuff. Yeah, and every episode is different, so pick and choose what works for you. Yes. If there's something <laughs> that you love and want to hear people talk about, there is a good chance that it's somewhere in there. You will find something. And thank you to everyone for spending some time with us here today. So if you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. And if that somehow isn't enough for you, you can also email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. If you are able to support us monetarily and want to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, reviews, and more. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. 
Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Thank you.